Um, he's a long way. <laughs> um, uh, he's got a long list of his name, including one of the 50 people to save the world, uh, which is quite impressive. Um, he's also the current CEO of a charity founded, which was the uh, Ecological Sequarian Trust. And some other very impressive things like master bridge builder, master city planner, all very impressive. So um, I'll just hand over to you, Peter. Thank you very much. Thanks. So um, hello, everybody. It's a great pleasure to spend a little under an hour with you today. Um, I, I'm, I was really excited about being asked to talk to you because uh, I'm, I've always had a great respect for Engineers Without Borders. And your latest uh, UK strategy aligns extremely well with uh, what I'm going to talk about today. So um, I'm hoping that it will strike a chord for you. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about COP26 that I've just returned from. And uh, I think I, I, I would say that everyone on the street and in the, in the blue and green zones would say it's now too late for anything other than systems transformation. Uh, we're not going to solve the problems we've got now by, by individual projects. We're going to have to do it by transforming our, the whole system of the way we live. So that's really what I'm going to talk about today. And uh, the, I, I'm a systems person. I, I give uh, lectures at the Systems Centre, as was in Bristol University. And my journey started when I was in Arup, uh, helping to build up their integrated systems planning business. And uh, I was invited by the Institution of Civil Engineers to give the Br Brunel Lecture in 2008. And I chose to use the subject of how do we make the transition to what I call the ecological age uh, as, as engineers. Uh, and I set out to answer these questions. Can, can we actually move towards a sustainable way of living? Is, is there such a thing? Uh, and if there is, what policies and investments are needed in, in countries of all, all different incomes? And how might we enable people to live more lightly on the planet and drive, deliver this transition? And basically, I outlined the fact that this was a systems problem that needed system solutions. So I'm going to use that material and everything I've done since to help, uh, help you understand uh, what the problems and solutions are and hopefully help you in your careers to be involved in delivering those solutions. So I'm gonna start by talking about the problems and, and your, your little uh, video, Engineers Without Borders video says this very clearly. It, it's basically uh, the first problem is about an open, wasteful use of non-renewable resources and the pollution that comes from them. And the, the, the most obvious example of that is, is uh, global emissions causing climate change. And this um, graphic is a bit old now, but it illustrates the point fairly well that the Earth and its atmosphere exchange carbon dioxide and other gases every year in a, in a yearly cycle. And the oceans and the soils and vegetation and trees exchange a huge amount of carbon dioxide every year between the, the, the northern uh, summers and winters, because that's where most of the forests are. And uh, the amount of exchange, if you add this up, is about 200 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide a year. Um, we are, as humans, we're creating things that, that throw more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere from oil and gas. And an awful lot of that stays up there and doesn't come down. In fact, roughly half of what we emit is absorbed back again over the yearly cycle, but half of it stays up there. And, and this 6.3 number is the net figure, and that's almost doubled or trebled now since this was done. And that's creating uh, global warming. And recently, there's some research that shows that with 70% increase in net emissions over the last, I think, 10 years, um, the, the, the trees and uh, vegetation absorb about 12% of that, uh, and the rest stays up there. So we're, we're, the, 
if you look out there, the trees and, and everything is now growing faster and there's more leaves and more branches and everything because of global warming. But of course the planet's warming and we've, we've had 1.2 degrees of warming and we're heading at the moment with emissions still going up to around two and a half to three degrees of warming by the end of the century or possibly even earlier now, which is uh, going to be pretty catastrophic really for uh, life on, on, on the planet. One of the reasons that's happening is because we, we're sort of in denial about the way we should uh, live on the planet. Uh, if we were to live in harmony with the natural world, which has got quite a few uh, billion years of experience of, of how to survive on this planet, um, we, we know some of the answers. Jeffrey West, who, was a, who is a physicist, who has done a lot of research on cities and has analysed the, the way that cities work and function and how resources flow and how people uh, live and compared it with uh, ecological systems and organisms, particularly the successful ones like fungi and, and rainforests. And the obvious difference in characteristic is that in cities, we, as the cities get bigger, we live in a, at a faster and faster rate, even though resources are used slightly more efficiently, we, we all speed up. Uh, if you walk in a large city, you walk a lot faster than you do in a small town or a village. Uh, and clearly, uh, as more and more people move to cities over the next uh, 40 or 50 years, that, that is not a sustainable, resilient way to operate. Uh, fungi and rainforests have worked out a way of actually uh, living extremely slowly and, and in harmony with all the other systems. And they live very, very long periods of time as a result. And so we now realise that to get to the ecological age, we have to sort of slow things down and use resources in a completely different way. I did go to COP26 um, and there, there are a number of things to say about it. One is that the, the fact that they said at the beginning it's a critical year for the future of the planet and we have an opportunity to make the changes to, to, to really uh, stop the awful things happening. Um, as Greta Thunberg said, there was a lot more blah, 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 and, um, and no real commitments to, to change things very much. So I think we're still on track for two to two and a half, maybe even three degrees of warming, despite what was said at the end. Uh, the promises are still promises, they're not real action. So I found it pretty depressing, and a lot of people on the street were also pretty depressed by it and uh, walking with them. Uh, it seems to me now everyone is really determined to uh, move forward somehow, that national governments are really not up to the task. Uh, the UN isn't really configured to, to enable this to happen because they're funded by governments and, and they're not really able to move things very fast. So I think there's going to be an increased movement of people of all ages to come together and work out what to do. And it seems to me that Engineers Without Borders is one of those initiatives, and it would be great to continue to work together uh, around that outcome. So let's move on to systems problem number two, which is that the resources that are available to support our lives are being reduced by population growth. This is a pretty simple point, really, uh, illustrated by this slide, which shows that in 1900, we had about eight hectares of land to support each person's life. Uh, but by 2020, we only have um, less than two hectares per person because of population growth. The planet hasn't grown uh, and the number of people has gone up. So basically we have to live in a way where we only uh, we live sustainably using that lower amount of land. But unfortunately, uh, we're living as if this hasn't happened and we're using more and more resources rather than less and less uh, to provide our energy, to provide our food and to provide the stuff that uh, goes into the things we use. And um, typically at the moment in China, China's now consuming about three hectares of land per capita. That's the ecological footprint. Um, and um, even ch so China's way over its global earth share. 
and uh, by 2050 we've got to get down to one and a half hectares per person uh, with us in the UK at around six that means we've got to have a almost a factor four reduction in the consumption of or the destruction of, of the ecological systems that support our lives if we're going to work this out. And to give an example of what that really means, in, in China, uh, when I did the Brunel lecture, the ecological footprint, the amount of land they were using was going up because of the very extreme development and infrastructure construction. Their footprint was growing about 4% a year. So if you work that out at about three hectares per person, 4% increase a year, that's around 100 million hectares of new land they have to find every year to, to drive that rate of growth. And that's sort of twice the size of France. So you can see, you know, that China's been using up a huge amount of, uh, been mining all over the world and using up a huge amount of land in order to drive its, uh, its so-called development. But other countries like Indonesia and, and India and, and Africa won't be able to do that because um, uh, China has, has used a huge amount already. So we have to find a new way of moving forward. The, one of the reasons why that stuff is happening is because we're using as a success factor in the world, uh, the GDP, gross domestic product, which was uh, put in place after the war to drive um, huge amounts of jobs and consumption after the war to get to, to get the uh, society to recover, but it stayed in place. And of course, what it's doing is driving increased consumption and increased destruction. Uh, and that is not success, um, as, as we realise. And one of the things about GDP growth is it's driving inequality. Uh, this is the Gini coefficient, and it just shows as the world's GDP has grown, the inequality gets bigger and bigger. And so it's not actually delivering the outcomes that uh, most of us who I suppose I call myself a social democrat uh, really believe is right. So, so basically, um, the final systems problem is that we're destroying the ecosystems that support our life. Uh, and provide our water, food and energy. And this is now called a code red for people and nature. And it is very, very serious. I was one of the authors of a report that was done in about 2016 called the Planetary Health Commission report on the, um, the health of human civilization and its dependence on the health of the ecological systems. And in it, it's, it's a pretty depressing reading, I'm afraid, but it's, it's saying we've basically been mortgaging the health of future generations to realize the economic and development gains in the present. And some of the facts in it are very shocking. And one of them was, was that, um, that uh, uh, diseases would jump from, from the natural world into the human world because we're destroying the world that these diseases live in. And uh, so it was, it was forecast that pandemics would become more serious and, and more frequent. And that, of course, has happened subsequently. So basically destroying land, um, soil erosion, water scarcity, um, loss of bees and pollinators, overfishing the oceans, and now, of course, acidification caused by absorbing carbon dioxide are getting uh, more and more problematical. And of course, as the temperatures rise, the ecological systems uh, begin to struggle. So that's my uh, depressing introduction. <laughs> so uh, I'm, I'm happy to take any questions at this point, um, but I, I guess this is stuff you probably know quite well. Has anyone got a quick question you want to ask well, before I move on to the solutions? Doesn't sound like it. So let me carry on. Perfect. It's, it's just wondering, is one of those um, problems the most impactful, do you think? Um, um, I mean, which one's the like, worst problem? I think the ecological destruction is probably the worst one because at the end of the day, um, if it was just climate change, you know, I think we would somehow soldier along and find ways to deal with it. Mm. But, but food, energy and water are fundamental, or food and water really. Yeah. And, and if, they, if, if we can't actually um, 
get that to work and we can't you know, if, if, if natural systems don't support us anymore and start dying off, then we're really in trouble because there isn't really a future. Um, so so I, I personally think that that's worse. And unfortunately, it's not what everyone talks about most of the time. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. So system solution number one is that the world has come together and said, let's change direction. Uh, with global and national policies. And the obvious ones are the global goals, which were established uh, around 2015. And, and they consist of these different ones. So we have the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, it's called the SDGs, which um, you, you'll have noticed a logo behind my head as I'm talking to you. Um, then the Paris Agreement on, on reducing emissions, which, uh, as I've just said, five years after Paris, um, not as much progress has been made as we would have hoped in Paris at, at that time. Then there's the Sendai framework for um, disaster risk reduction, which is um, a process where, where we're actually looking at resilience and disaster risk reduction, because as climate change takes hold, we have to actually cope with it. Uh, and then there's something called the New Urban Agenda, which actually supports the way we actually plan and develop our cities uh, and do it in a better way. So all of that uh, has to come together now in term, in, into what we call risk-informed sustainable development going forward, which is, a, which is a complex set of requirements. And one of the key ones is that nobody is left behind. Uh, and that means that we have to move away from GDP as a success factor. I've done some work recently on the integrated systems planning side, which is what I was very, very um, busy doing in Arup. And when I left Arup, I set up this charity to try and create the tools for integrated risk-based planning. And I wrote a joint uh, policy paper with others uh, at, and that was presented at the G20 meeting in Saudi Arabia last year on, on how infrastructure, sustainable infrastructure, could be planned, designed and implemented and financed in order to deliver some of these um, uh, global goal objectives. So that's quite a useful reference if you want to follow that, tra that track. Another piece of um, sort of hopeful change is is the european green deal in my view of all the countries or, or, or regions of the world that have tried to grasp this nettle the european green deal is probably the closest to a real effort to try and get this agenda this uh, holistic agenda for change to happen so uh, that is worth uh, following up on if you're interested now we come on to modelling. Um, I really do believe that modelling of complex systems at global and regional scale can help un underpin and support and, and enable transformational change to happen. And certainly in the EU Green Deal, um, they have embraced this idea um, and they've said that accessible and interoperable data should be at the heart of data-driven innovation in the Green New Deal. And there is a, a very major um, program going on at the moment to develop the both earth scale and local scale systems um, modeling to enable this to happen. And there is, of course, the Horizon Europe program, which um, will uh, help to support investment in all of this. So I'm going to show you a brief little video now of what I mean by this digital environment. So at the moment, we have these amazing earth scale models of, uh, of weather systems, of atmosphere, of the Earth's plates, of the Earth's core, of the way that um, ecology uh, moves, how, uh, how aerosols move around the planet. And this is all um, informed by satellite technology, which is now monitoring the Earth uh, in all sorts of ways. And it is going to be possible to set up these earth scale models um, and then connect them up with regional scale models, which use the satellite data to be able to model the resource flows that we have on the ground, the way that we're interacting with the natural world 
the way that um, we're consuming and polluting or restoring the natural world and how this relates to investments in infrastructure uh, and, and modeling infrastructure using digital twins, which can enable us to uh, envisage and steer investments in a better way. And the sorts of planning platforms that this one already exists in Holland, um, it's been developed by Geodan. Um, these sorts of platforms will then be used for collaborative decision making, which will enable us to be better informed about the impact of infrastructure design on communities and on the surrounding environment uh, and uh, both health and job creation and other things uh, to enable us to, to, to understand all of that much better. So these, these systems don't exist at the moment, but we're working pretty hard in resilience brokers to try and help evolve these types of integrated systems, which should enable us to, to scenario test uh, better holistic solutions going forward. In order to do that, we can then set performance-based targets for city regions once we have those models. And in low to middle income countries, um, they're, they're, where they're moving from a, an agrarian economy, from a, a rural economy into a more of an urban one, it's probably sensible, and this is what I said in the Brunel lecture, that the transition should be one from the agricultural age directly to the ecological age that it's not a good idea for uh, developing countries to, to, to try and move to an industrial model and then have to retrofit their way back out of that into an ecological model. Much better that they embrace all the, all the technologies and systems we have to go directly to an ecological model. And that's something that we hope we can support. There are some ecological cities being planned and developed which are attempting to do this. This is a, a, a brief little sketch really that came out of the work uh, that Arup did in China, showing how it's possible in an ecological city or an ecological age city to interconnect um, and supply uh, energy, for example, from waste products in the city to use uh, passenger transport using uh, uh, public transport largely rather than relying on cars and running everything on electricity and recycling wastewater and all the things that are sensible. Uh, and the cost of doing all this can be dramatically reduced um, to, to enable people to live a better life. If we compare that with where we are in the UK and uh, other middle and high income countries, there, of course, we've got to retrofit our way out of an industrial model towards the ecological age model, which means um, whole scale retrofitting and aiming for regeneration and reconnecting of urban and rural systems which have been disconnected. And uh, there are some pretty advanced plans going on in some cities. I would say that Copenhagen's plan is probably one of the, the best ones, but it still doesn't have many of the things I, I would hope it could have. Um, so we do have some examples, but this is probably one of the great challenges that we're facing in the UK at the moment in this sort of leveling up agenda that we're talking about has to really embrace these things. And I was very pleased to see in your strategy video that you're talking now a lot about regeneration. Uh, we did some development of total community retrofit models in the Institute for Sustainability that I, I ran for a while. And it's very obvious that what we've got to do is really improve water efficiency at the same time as improving sustainable transport at the same time as uh, retrofitting our buildings to be more resource efficient and uh, looking at community owned systems to enable this to happen, particularly for renewable energy supply and upcycling and remanufacturing uh, as part of the process. And all of that's got to be um, replicable and scalable uh, very quickly. This can create lots of jobs and it's possible to create new business models to drive all this forward. Uh, but it's pretty radical stuff, and it means that the way we live is going to be different. So the way in which one might approach making this transformation happen is to set up these local systems models that I've talked about, and then create what we call regional collaboratories or uh, living labs, 
um, and to enable with these tools people to set up new business models um, with artificial intelligence support to enable investment to move towards these new regional efforts. And this is something that um, um, we, we have been attempting to demonstrate recently. One, one it, this is probably the most important slide I'm going to show you in terms of how you make transformational change happen. Uh, those of you who, who may have been involved a little bit in infrastructure, sustainable infrastructure development and design will know that you start off with these grand objectives of having you know, really strong economic, environmental and social improvements as a result of the infrastructure. But as planning goes forward and, and procurement starts, you tend to move to the lowest cost solution and the particularly environmental and social benefits tend to get squeezed out. So on the left hand side there, you never end up with what you, you were after and you usually end up with something you didn't really want in the first place because the process drives it out. Whereas if we've now got these local models, what we can do in the procurement process is say that we've got these objectives. We want you as a design and building infrastructure team to, to deliver these, in, these objectives for the lowest cost. And we're going to provide you with these systems tools to, so you can demonstrate to us that you're going to do that successfully. Either that, or you could say, I've got a certain pot of money here and I want to drive these these benefits and uh, the person who demonstrates the biggest benefits will be the one that gets the job for the given price. Either way, it completely changes the way that uh, infrastructure and planning would happen in the future. And this is really the, the way it's, we have to go if we're going to make the change happen. So I said that we had been trying to uh, make some of these things happen. Uh, when the COVID, when COVID struck last year, um, we, decided to, uh, a few of us, uh, a few friends across the world decided to uh, bring, try and bring people together and see if we could get a volunteer group of people to come together and maybe see if we could connect to some artificial intelligence tools to actually help some regions to make some of these transformations happen. So we worked on Zoom together and we found uh, an artificial intelligence system called Spark Beyond which is able to do very rapid research on existing uh, ideas and, and systems and research, and then connect that up to a, um, a laboratory, a local laboratory, and to follow through with a whole range of um, uh, different uh, specialist uh, uh, teams who could then come together in a collaborative way to, to help deliver some change. And we had a whole lot of work streams. And those of you who are specializing in the engineering field will see any, any, any of the ones that you're interested in listed here. And we had a work group in each of these working together uh, for the last two years. And they have come together in a living lab in Exeter in the UK to try and help the city move forward to net zero. And uh, just to illustrate some of the things that we've been doing, we've created a Kumu uh, model map of the uh, way in which uh, these different uh, resources and systems interact with each other. And uh, the, the maps we built, this is a, a map we've built in, in Exeter. And the black dots are the, uh, the work streams, the individual silos. And then we worked out how they all interconnect together within the city. And this means that when you're looking at something like carbon dioxide in emissions, you can begin to research and investigate uh, how uh, the city and different uh, ways of living in the city drive those emissions and maybe start to understand uh, some ways in which the, all of that can be improved using this Kumu mapping system. And this Kumu map is fed into the artificial intelligence to enable it to, 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 be, to work a bit smarter in, in finding solutions. So th those are my sort of um, brief outlines on, on some of the, some of the uh, ways forward. And the final bit of my talk is going to be talking about real, real things on the ground, that, that examples of change that can uh, uh, come out of these, these planning and uh, policy approaches. But I'll stop again, just in case anyone's got any questions, because I'm rattling along fairly fast, I know. <laughs> 
Um, you briefly mentioned the uh, UN SDGs. How um, how effective do you think they've actually been so far? Because it's still like nine years left until the end date for them. Yes. No, it's a very good question. Um, I was involved in uh, writing one of them, the SDG 11 for cities. I was involved in writing that and, and fighting to have it in the, in the set of goals. And uh, basically, the, you know, if, if you look at the evidence on the ground, uh, we're way off delivering the SDGs now. Uh, and one of the reasons we're off track is the, the impact of the pandemic. Um, because the pandemics, you know, in order to survive that, it's used up a huge amount of public capital, uh, which might have been deployed in delivering the sustainable development goals. That's been used to, you know, to really survive and and keep business going and keep 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 society moving forward, um, but but not um, transforming. So I think uh, COVID has, has, has been a very, um, a very bad impact on the world and an awful lot of public capital, uh, a lot of borrowing has now gone up around the world because of COVID. And, uh, and I think it's gonna be really, really difficult now to move forward you know, to deliver the SDGs unless we follow this sort of radical transformation practice where maybe the cost could be reduced and local change can be can be mobilized and so local change trumps you know uh, regional transformational change that might help a bit but i think we're we're way off track and are likely to go further off track i think mm -hmm. yeah okay thanks oh yeah uh, I've got a question, if you yeah, don't sure. mind. Um, yeah. yeah, I was just, so you've spoken a lot about the ecological age, but I was wondering if you could just kind of expand a bit more of kind of exactly what it is, because I'm just not sure if I missed it or if I just, yeah. We'll yes. just... Yeah, thanks. No, sorry, I, 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 I didn't really describe it. In, in, my, in my Brunel lecture, I, I did describe it. Um, and I used a formula because I'm an engineer. I, I always like a formula. So, so basically what I said was it, we need a combination of reduction of, of, of global emissions um, in order to, to, to move off an industrial model of pollution. Um, and uh, that I said was, would be an 80% reduction in emissions for the world by 2050, uh, which um, if we'd done it would have aligned quite well with the Paris Agreement targets. So that was one part of it. So stopping uh, uh, pollution. Uh, the next part of it was to address this ecological footprint point that if we're going to allow the world to regenerate, we've got to stop um, uh, destroying ecological systems to provide resources and, and, and you know, mining and uh, forest deforestation has to stop and we have to uh, actually uh, start allowing regeneration to happen. The natural world is really good at regenerating itself. Uh, if we leave it alone. So, so basically, we, we need to allow the natural world to regenerate. And the only way that's going to happen is if we dramatically reduce uh, our ecological footprint and, and the, the impact we're, we're having on it. And then uh, the third component of, of the ecological age, of course, is that we leave no one behind and that we actually um, focus very hard on, on, on uh, closing the gap between the rich and the poor. Uh, but the bit that, that relates to ecology is, is, is the ecological footprint reduction, really. So does that help? Has that made it a bit clearer? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Is it also about kind of rephrasing or rethinking about how we consider waste as a, and waste is actually yeah. like a valuable resource rather than something we just discard? Yes, absolutely. Because ecological footprint is, is actually a, a measurement of that. So the only way you can reduce your ecological footprint is you have to stop wasting things and you have to reuse them and uh, reincorporate them in life um, uh, as, as, a, as a resource rather than the waste. Yeah, Brilliant. I'll touch Thank on you. that. I'll touch on that now, actually. Oh, thanks. So, so a, a very quick snapshot that came from this uh, Pivot Projects initiative I mentioned earlier on. Um, we, we, we did a bit of a survey about the, what the world was saying about the way forward. And this is a sort of snapshot of what one might call a flourishing society uh, post-COVID, you know, a, a, a green uh, restoration of life. 
after after COVID-19. Uh, and uh, I'll, I'll let you just read them. I won't read them all out. But, but I've, I've already talked about a lot of them, reversing deforestation, um, uh, regenerative agriculture, regenerative ocean farming, um, buildings that are turned into being power stations. So instead of having to provide energy to buildings, they use solar energy to, to enable them to operate through the year, uh, which is now becoming a, a possibility. And using nature-based infrastructure rather than hard infrastructure, um, to, which, which China's doing in things called sponge cities, where water stored underground or in lakes or in natural systems uh, to reduce flood risk. And then overall, um, a, what's called a circular regenerative economy, which addresses your point about reusing uh, materials and, and allowing the natural world to regenerate at the same time. Um, so that, that's basically the sort of big picture um, which we're now looking at. So here's a few examples of not recent things. This, this is quite a long time ago now. But this is an illustration of how uh, damaging it is to build major roads in cities. Uh, when the vehicles uh, create pollution and noise uh, and uh, they don't, re you know, big roads and cities don't actually help the economy to flourish at all. Uh, they need to be kept out. Uh, the city of Seoul decided to test this out. A very, a very adventurous mayor decided to remove this freeway and uh, reinstate a, a water course that ran through the city in that location. And this enabled poorer people to walk and cycle into the city center, um, which they couldn't do when the road was there. Uh, and uh, the footfall in the city center increased for the shops and businesses there. And uh, the air was cleaner and uh, health improved. Uh, and overall, it was very beneficial. So this showed very clearly that this idea of, of building roads in cities is a complete catastrophe. And, and we need to take them out and we need to, to allow walking, cycling and public transport to flourish so we have clean air and, uh, and st stop using cars in city centres. Electric vehicles is go are going to be very important in this transition. And, uh, you know, that this is obviously happening very quickly now. I noticed just uh, actually last week that 50% uh, of vehicles that were sold I think in the last six months were either hybrid or electric vehicles, which is an astonishing rate of change now in the UK, which is really good. Um, the other thing we can do is um, we, we've seen from uh, history that if a government invests around 1% of a city's GDP every year in, in, in rail transit or metros and in cycling routes, uh, you can actually create a very walkable um, and, and uh, well-connected city uh, and it takes just 1% of GDP, which actually is really affordable. It's a lot of money when you're used to building roads. But if you stop building roads, it's, it's quite affordable. So there is a transformation agenda about spending enough money on mass transport and walking and cycling routes and removing roads. Internet shopping and logistics are clearly changing everything. And therefore, one's got to evolve a different way of organising the way that... Uh, that goods get to people. Uh, and this will be done using distribution centers and combining different systems together. We've just done a, uh, uh, or I have just contributed to, to a very interesting green investment plan for Cumbria in the UK, which you can find on the web. And one of the ideas in there was to combine, uh, the, uh, combine goods deliveries to remote communities across Cumbria in the farming areas with, um, with on-demand um, uh, mobility transport systems. So uh, a, li a little uh, bus can deliver parcels and collect people and work out how to do that using artificial intelligence. Things like this will, will now start to happen. There's lots of opportunities for uh, entrepreneurship in this for all of you. If you want to be an entrepreneur in these sorts of spaces, there's big, big opportunities now. One big issue in, in order to stop deforestation is that the world should stop eating as much meat as it did before. Um, I'm not so personally worried about uh, farming and, and global emissions because I think we can deal with that. The bigger problem in my view is, is meat eating going up around the world is driving deforestation because the cattle need feed. 
and uh, a lot of deforestation in, in Brazil is happening because of demand for meat. Uh, and China has been one of the places where in, the, in those uh, 25 years, uh, meat eating in China went up uh, by two or three times, which has clearly had a huge impact on global resources. We're going to start um, um, building a lot of systems to grow more food in cities uh, using waste and recycled water. Uh, and uh, this is now taking hold quite quickly. Not all food, but certainly a lot of things, a lot of healthy food uh, components can, can actually be, be uh, grown in cities on rooftops and in vertical farms. And this is, this is the big trend. But I think probably the biggest and most important thing is that we reconnect up our rural and urban systems uh, so that uh, our water, energy, compost, nutrients that we're using are sustainably resourced uh, between the surrounding area around the city and the city itself. And uh, lots of very interesting examples coming forward now for, for doing this more effectively, which can, can be quite transformational. Global water availability is a huge problem and drought is, is increasing globally, partly created by climate change, but also driven by deforestation. Uh, forests around the world create a sort of water pump, what are called flying rivers that, that uh, cross our continents. And uh, increasingly, we're realizing that if you deforest uh, a place like the Amazon, water starts disappearing very quickly. And uh, Brazil depends uh, on, uh, on the forests um, and the water for its energy. And this is becoming a massive problem in Brazil right now as deforestation accelerates and the, and the reservoirs are dropping very quickly. So we've, the, these are reversible situations, um, and it, but it needs a massive global effort to actually uh, reverse the desertification of, of areas of the world. And China has done this and shown that it's possible. The urban water cycle is, is, is critical, and yet we, we don't recycle a lot of water that we could recycle. Um, and it's very obvious that we could actually um, uh, treat water and, and put it down into groundwater aquifers or into storage areas and then recycle it, uh, treat it further and recycle it back into the city. You know, a city like, uh, sorry, a country like Spain is amazing that it doesn't do this. And if you look at Madrid, uh, it struggles a lot to get its water, but it doesn't actually recycle much of it at all. Um, and and uh, it's something that we've got to start doing. And uh, it's another area where a lot of innovation, a lot of um, catchment uh, modeling and management systems can come into play. So coming back to this important point about uh, living in harmony with the natural world, one of the things I promoted in the, in the Brunel lecture was the idea of using biomimicry as a way of actually living more in harmony. So in, in answer to your question earlier about what the ecological age is, it will be adopting these principles of biomimicry, which is recognizing that diversification and cooperation are critical because all organisms do that between themselves, using waste as a resource, gathering and using energy efficiently, which is, relates to what I was talking about in buildings, optimizing and not maximizing. So instead of GDP maximization of resource use to optimize resource use to get the things we need, using materials really sparingly, uh, cleaning up all the time and not polluting, uh, not drawing down resources, but actually regenerating resources, remaining in balance with the biosphere, which is, which is really stopping uh, the changes that we're doing, we're doing at the moment, and running on information. Um, most uh, organisms every day don't decide what they're doing. They just, they just uh, adapt and uh, uh, adjust every day to local conditions. This diagram is, is really important for the future of uh, designing and building infrastructure. Uh, we have to have a, a very clear idea of what the life of infrastructure is or a building. Um, we have to have a design life for it and then we design it to be recycled and for materials to be reused at the end of that life cycle. And we need to be very clear about that process and design around it. At the moment, we're not doing that at all, really. Um, and a lot of buildings are pulled down and rebuilt without this uh, capability. 
One thing uh, about reusing uh, materials in, in cities is biological waste. Biological waste from animals and humans in cities can be recycled uh, by putting them in biodigesters, which will actually produce gas, or, uh, which can be used to make energy or use for cooking. And the waste can be used as uh, fertilizer and compost for food growing. And, and this natural cycle, it, we're not doing at all at the moment. Uh, but if we did it everywhere, it would make an enormous difference to transform the way that we uh, operate and live. A more, a more simpler example is up, just upcycling materials uh, into valuable product as part of the economy. Um, this is a, these are a series of upcycled jewellery products, which are, are really beautiful. Uh, and uh, I quite like the Trend Hunter website, although it's changed a bit over the years. It's still quite good for following some of these trends and, and opportunities. So finally, just talking about running on information. Um, Moving forward in cities with information architecture and smart grids, we have a lot of these tools available, building information management systems, infra infrastructure uh, management systems, all of the virtual reality and, and things that I talked about earlier on, uh, that sort of digital world it can now be connected to all, all the tools that we have in cities, CCTV, um, parking systems, which can, be, can guide you to, to the place rather than driving around and around obviously broadband and uh, uh, at least 4G systems, and, and then having management systems which can be increasingly managed by uh, AI systems as well to, to get performance-based management out of the, out of the system. Uh, all of this is going to be really important to underpin uh, the transformation I'm talking about. So that's hopefully given you a few ideas of the sort of changes that uh, might come about. So we've got 10 minutes or so to um, um, have any questions that you've got. And th those are my contact details if, you're, if you want to follow up. Uh, if any of you want to join Pivot Projects, you can do that very easily by going to the website, uh, either as a volunteer or just as a curious um, uh, person who wants to see what we're doing. Uh, you, you'd be very welcome to join us. Um, that's the website. So very happy to answer any questions you've got about anything, really. <laughs> um, I've got a question. So hi, Peter. Um, yes. That was a really, really great talk. Um, really, really insightful. And uh, my question is quite simple, but quite big in terms of Obviously, we're all students here who are going to be graduating in the next few years and working um, in industry. Kind of yeah. what's the best thing that we can do currently mm. um, to kind of facilitate, well, not facilitate, but help these changes? Yeah. Well, um, I, guess, I guess the obvious thing is, is the way you live, <laughs> which is you don't have so many choices. I, I know it's very difficult when you're a student because you don't have that many choices that you can make. Um, but where you can make you know, better choices um, than do you know, by, by looking at products and the way, where they come from and how they're made, you know, where, where the food is grown, um, is, it, is it grown locally? Uh, and and you know, the, there are some fairly obvious things you can do like that. Uh, other things you can do is influence your friends and your families um, and, and reach out to them and, and explain to them how important all of this is and how urgent it is. So I, I would suggest that's another thing you can do. Um, and then as you, as you move forward towards your career and looking for jobs, then of course you can uh, you know, start doing your research on, on how, you, depending on what you want to do. But um, uh, start researching, looking for places where you could work and, and move forward in. And I suppose the final thing is is look look to see if you can do some uh, voluntary work and and get, gain a better understanding of, of how to make these changes happen on the ground and, and maybe even try them out. Which I guess engineers without borders provide some opportunities for that, uh, which is one of the reasons I respect it so much. I'm not sure I've really answered your question very well, but it's a few things. No, it's good. <laughs> um, building on that a little bit, actually, I was just wondering, because um, obviously a lot of 
kind of on, on a national scale, um, a lot of decisions are made by the government and then below them, then the companies that um, kind of act on the decisions that the government, government makes. Like what, how effective, if the government is just um, like with COP26, a lot of talk and not much um, mm -hmm. action, is there much that engineering companies can do to kind of override that or like to bring it down to like our level again, if we graduate into and become engineers, as much we can do kind of overrides kind of inaction from the government? Yeah, it's a very good question, Ollie, and one which I've been asking myself for about 15 years. Um, yeah, I, I'm basically big construction companies and uh, and consultancies uh, do contribute a huge amount to this problem. I think it says that on your video. I think it says 38% of, of the problems are created by, by the construction industry. So, so basically, uh, the first thing to say is it's not good enough for the industry to say it's not our problem, it's down to governments, because it's it's construction companies and, and consultants who do it. Um, so, it, and, and they should stop doing it. Um, they should say no to, to this stuff and, and come together and say, look, you know, this has got to change. We're, you know, civil engineers are in government, civil engineers are, are in private sector, civil engineers are, are in society, and we should say, We've got to stop this and and actually, you know, be a be a, a force for change. And I think that's what Engineers Without Borders is aiming to do, to bring together half a million people around the world to say we're not going to do this anymore. Certainly in France, there's a whole group of architects who come together and, and young people and said we're not going to work for companies who are who are doing this destructive stuff. And I think I think that's you know that's what we've got to do. And I, I'm very happy to advocate. <laughs> for that um, and I've been trying to do that myself and it isn't very popular uh, in, in, in big companies who, uh, who, who are really trying to do the right thing but big construction companies now you know in London if you design a, 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 a building that produces a huge amount of emissions both in its operation and in its construction you now have to pay money to, to, to actually offset that um, and and the, the, the mayor has brought in those rules. So companies are now facing massive amounts of, of money if they carry on the same track. They've, they're now being forced to change. So things are starting to happen. Um, and it's, it's going to be led, I think, more from the bottom and the middle than it is from the top. And, and it's, going to be, it's going to be tough, but it's going to provide you with lots of opportunities to, to do some really great work in your careers, in my view. Um, and people like me will help to try and establish the, the platform in which you can do it. Um, but, but the change has really got to start now. We can't, we can't keep doing it. Any project, you look out in, in Bristol or anywhere else and you look out at a project that's not doing it, you should call it out. You say, why are you doing this? You know, this isn't going to help. This is going to be part of the problem in the future. No, thanks. Uh, yeah, if I could just jump in, I think my kind of question and feelings are the same as um, me and Oliver's. I think it's kind of like, where do we start? I mean, yeah. all of those ideas are uh, logical and they make sense and uh, they're obviously going to bring about massive change. But it is, yeah, where do we start? How do we kind of yeah. do it is the challenge, I think. Yeah, no, I, I, I understand that, James. And um you know, when I talk to the students in, in the course um, and I talk about, you know, where, where, where do you go? What do you do? Um, my, my view is that you, you, the best thing to do is get some experience of doing, doing the right things as quickly as you can. Um, you know, get some experience of, on the ground of doing really good projects. They can be quite small, you know, they don't have to be very big. But try and get some experience of, of doing the right things. And, and if you do that, you'll be in demand very, very quickly, because this is going to happen now. And, and I think the more experience and knowledge you've got in this area, the more in demand you're going to be in, in the world going forward. So I, I would, you know, try, try and grab some, some opportunities that are coming, coming along to, to, to just show, show how this can be done. 
uh, even in quite a small scale, or even do some yourselves in, within your own communities. Uh, and, and very quickly, you'll be in demand because this is going to be mainstreaming really quickly in your early careers, I think. Do you have any examples or any, like, play, point us in any direction of where we can do that? Um, not immediately, but, but I think um, uh, there, there are a lot of small startups around uh, aiming to try and support this, you know, new apps and new, and new, new ideas. So I think if, if you just hunt around wherever you live or where your family live or whatever, you go hunting around, you'll find people trying to make change happen in your communities or in your areas. And, and um, you know, see, see, you know, try and join up with them and see, see what's going to be possible uh, using the skills that you've got already. That's what I would suggest. You know, go and look at it locally. Yeah, definitely. So, like, start small and just see yeah. what's around you, and then yeah. build. Because once you've got that, even a little bit of stuff like that on your CV, you'll find it it works very, very quickly, very well in your favour. Okay, thank you. That's good advice. Um, I had one other question, and it's more just, um, you know, do you have any recommended reading or anything we can like any good resources to go to to learn more? Um, gosh, that's a very big question. Um, I could, I could probably provide Ollie with, a, with, with a list if that's, that's probably the best thing to do. I'm not going to be to think off the top of my head quickly enough to give the answer, but, uh, I'm happy to send Ollie a little list that might be helpful. If that's okay. Yeah. Um, and we can get that out, um, I guess in the next newsletter, we can provide a yeah. link to that or we'll, work, we'll find a way to get it out to you. So yeah, yeah be great. Thank you. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. I actually have one more question. Um, I, I did some research over summer about um, implementing geothermal energy in Bristol on a district scale, and I was doing a lot of case study research. And one of the main problems I found was that when you do an economic analysis between geothermal and, say, gas, uh, natural gas, um, gas wins every time because geothermal has got a high capex. Yeah. And developers just don't want anything to do about it. But something that's brought up a lot was that these appraisals don't take into account um, kind of the cost of carbon. Hmm. Yeah. Um, do you think there's a way that, um, like a good way to implement that in economic appraisals or a way forward through that? It's very difficult, I think, because gas, oil and gas particularly, have had so much investment over the years in, in their enabling infrastructure. You know, you're, you're not really paying for that anymore. It's all been paid for. So basically, you've got, you've got a price which isn't at all comparable with new technology development. So it's very difficult. And ge geothermal is particularly problematical because um, it, 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 as you say, it requires a lot of, um, a lot of deep wells and, and deep stuff, particularly in a place like Bristol. So I think geothermal is particularly difficult, um, but I think um, for, you know, PV, so, solar um, and, and wind are, are basically still now comparable um, and, and it's possible now to provide large scale solar and wind uh, energy uh, at a similar price to to new oil and gas, uh, in fact, it's cheaper. So, so actually, um, I, I think geothermal is probably not a great idea unless you're in a location where it's much closer to the surface. Um, you know, there are parts of the world and even down in Cornwall where it's perhaps a bit more viable. Um, but, but generally, I think it's where it's very deep. It's is probably not going to be possible. Uh, some some people have done it converting coal mines. Uh, where you've already got the, the the tunnels and things underground, where you can tap into the warm water, um, but I think without that, it's it's a bit more difficult to to make it work. Yeah, we've been looking at the coal mines in Bristol a bit as well, and in the hot springs as well, and hot yeah. wells. Um, yeah. But yeah, I was thinking more like more generally rather than Bristol as well. Is there room to include like the cost of carbon into the lifestyle? Uh, like life cycle costs of projects like um, geothermal or solar or wind. Yeah. yeah, well, I mean, part part of the methodology I was talking about earlier on is we we have to adopt a life cycle 
approach to performance. Um, and clearly carbon is part of that. And, and, and when we have a carbon price, you know, of at least, you know, 50 pounds a ton, which it will get to that level fairly soon, I think, with all this net zero pledging that's going on, I think carbon prices are going to go up because there's, there's, you know, it's quite hard to find places where you can offset that level of carbon. So uh, I think that the price is probably going to end up going up because uh, once people realize how difficult it is, um, you know, everyone's going to be scrambling for those opportunities. So, so I, I, th I think that that's, that's going to be good. But, but, but even at that level, um, it's hard to make projects work unless they're very efficient. Nice day. Thank you. Okay, well, if there aren't any more questions, I guess you've probably got better things to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're out of time, I'm afraid. Um, yeah, that was, that was really good, actually. Thank you. Um, yeah, we've got that recorded. So if anyone wants to rewatch that, um, we'll get that uploaded to YouTube. Um, so yeah, if you missed anything, once we watch it, then it'll be up there. Great. Um, yeah, well, thank it's you. It's been a great pleasure. Thanks for the invite, Ollie. And, and, yeah, just, and to wish you all well and hope you have a great holiday, if, assuming you get 